So I have a lot of friends that have constantly gone through stuff that like people don't need to go through like rape and like deaths in like our graduating class. We've had three people die from car accidents in the past month. And people are constantly asking me, why would God allow this to happen to such wonderful Christ-like people, people that are seeking His face? And honestly, when people ask me that question, I'm stumped, I don't know what to say, so I'd like to hear what you would say to them. You bet. I do not know why three of your friends in the past month have been killed in car accidents. I don't know why God allowed that. I do not know. And I would plead with you, always begin with that. Four words, I do not know. Second point, what I do know is life is unfair. God is fair. Please never get the two mixed up. It's one of the main points of the book of Job. Job understood, my life is unfair, but I'm not going to make the mistake of clenching my fist and waving it in God's face and blaming God, because I know that although life is unfair, God is fair, meaning by that God's character is good. Life has good and evil intertwined. You see, sir, that's why, if you and I are going to follow Christ, we have to be skeptics. You and I cannot blindly believe. Why? Because good and evil are so intertwined in this world that if you just blindly believe, 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 you're going to get ripped off. That's why Jesus says, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So this whole idea that you will hear from some Christians, you just got to believe, man. You just got to believe. No, you don't just got to believe. You got to look at the evidence. You got to critically think, is this person reliable or not? And then you got to choose to trust or not to trust. So you and I live in a world where good and evil are so intertwined but you got to be a skeptic, but what you got to realize is life is unfair, God is fair. Now, how do we know that God is fair? How do we know that God is good? Not because we read the morning newspaper. We know that God is good because Jesus Christ revealed that God loves all of us so much so that he became a human being to rescue us from death, to forgive us and to give us eternal life. Well, I promise you, sir, if you die for me, I'm not going to question your love for me. I hope if I die for you and sacrifice my life for you, that you're not going to go around saying, wow, I wonder if Cliff loved me. All right, guys, what are we doing running around saying, I wonder if God loves me. He became a human being. He died on a cross for me. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if God loves me. Come on, guys, get it into gear. God loves you. He proved it by becoming man in Christ, who died for you, to forgive you and to give you eternal life. Trust in him. Life is unfair. God is fair. Don't get the two mixed up. God did not kill your three buddies in that car accident. It's a result of living in a fallen, messed up world. Next and final point is, although I do not know why God allowed those accidents to happen that led to those tragic deaths, I do know that God is a suffering God who has provided the ultimate solution for suffering and death. Forgiveness and eternal life in a heaven where there will be no more car accidents that snuff out lives, but eternal life in the presence of God. So come on, my atheist friend, let's go to the morgue. Come on, my atheist friend, let's look at his body as it lies there in a casket. What's your solution? Ultimately, the only honest solution of an atheist is despair. Tough luck, guy. Wrong place, wrong time. That's the way the ball bounces. Good. That's despair, which is very logical if there is no God. But you and I, as followers of Christ, can stand at that casket and know that because he put his faith in Christ, 
And because you and I have put our faith in Christ, we will see him again one day. He will have a new body, you'll have a new body, I'll have a new body, and we will live for eternity together in heaven. That is the ultimate solution for the problem of suffering and death. Exactly why God allowed it all, I do not know. Secondly, I do know that life is unfair, but God is fair. Thirdly, I do know that God has given us the ultimate solution for suffering and death, eternal life in heaven, where there'll be no more suffering, no more death. Thank you, sir, for raising that issue. If he knows exactly how I feel, who I am, what I am, he can't force me to be a Christian, but right. being a Christian is indeed the best thing for me. Could he not set things in motion that would, in the end, cause me to come to Christianity, to come to God myself? And wouldn't he, being omnibenevolent, wouldn't he, loving us, cause as many of us as possible to be Christian? Okay. If anybody ever says to you, God is omnipotent, which means God can do anything, they're lying. They're out of touch with reality. The omnipotent God cannot make 2 plus 2 equal 5. The omnipotent God cannot make square circles. And the omnipotent God cannot give you the gift of free will and me the gift of free will and then cause us to, force us to, manipulate us to do whatever or believe whatever. When he gives us free will, he is limiting his power and saying, I am sorry, I have created you with a free will, I will respect that fact, and I will not cause you, force you, manipulate you. Instead, I will respect your dignity, which means the judgment of God, of you and me, is motivated by his respect of your dignity and my dignity to make up our minds. That's why he judges us. Because we've been given free will, he holds us responsible for what we decide. In that case, I have, I've always had trouble. The thing is, we're on Earth for a finite time. Yes. And I've always had trouble reconciling a finite mistake, yes. a finite problem. Yep. Let, let's say I don't. I, I just decide to reject God. I decide I hate God, and then I die. Yep. And then I go to hell forever. Yep. It seems unreasonable in a finite amount of time to have an infinite reward or punishment. You it bet. It can only be so good or so bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, you think well. That's a problem. You're absolutely right. Finite life with infinite consequences. Good gracious. What's going on? I agree with you. That's a problem. But let's be real honest. What that says about your life and my life is not that it's trivial. Instead, what it says about our life is be careful. Because according to Christ, the decisions and the actions that you and I choose in this life have eternal consequences. So it doesn't minimize, it doesn't trivialize life, it puts a tremendous amount of urgency to life. Choose carefully, choose wisely. Second point, I hate to tell you, but the only reason that atheists at Texas State exist is for the same reason that a criminal never finds the police because the criminal is running away from the police not running towards the police and the only reason a person doesn't find God is not because of their environment it's not because of a low IQ it's not because they got the wrong potty training or the wrong mom and dad it's because they're running away from God so nobody goes to hell because oh shoot they were born in the wrong culture at the wrong time they didn't have the right opportunity the only reason people go to hell is is because they're running away from God. And God says, I respect your decision to run. But you're running. But if you live for something or someone that falls far short of that standard of evidence, you're an intellectual hypocrite, right? Because you've said to me, 
the reason I can't believe in Christ, the reason I can't believe in God, is because X amount of evidence has not been met. Fine, I understand. You're a real skeptic. You want X amount of evidence to be met. Now, I'm a searcher after truth. Christ doesn't meet the standard of, ev of evidence for you? Fine, no problem. But now, you better tell me what you are living for and how the preponderance of evidence shows you that what you're living for is true. It's scary. It's scary to listen to people answer the question, what am I living for and what's the evidence that what I am living for is true? I wish God would give you more proof. You know, I wish God would sort of hit you over the head and say, boo, it's me. Just Believe in me. All right? But what you've got to consider there is what we were talking about earlier, the self-restraint of God in not answering my prayers the way I want them answered. I mean, I prayed for a lot of people that God would heal them, and he didn't heal them. They died. I prayed for a lot of my skeptical friends that they would come to see Christ and put their faith in him. They haven't yet. Now, how do I deal with that? How do I think that through? It's by grappling with exactly what the Bible portrays, which is the amazing self-restraint of God. He created you and me with a free will. He's not going to come up, hit you over the head, and say, boo, it's me. Instead, he's left evidence, more than enough evidence, for any thinking human being to believe he exists. But now it's a question of the will. Am I willing? to humble myself, accept the evidence, accept God's spirit drawing me to him, or am I not? So remember, God is incredibly self-restrained, incredibly humble, the way he does not force us or intellectually subdue us to believe in him. And to be honest with you, sir, at times that's frustrating, because I love you and I wish right now that I could give you a watertight proof that God exists. I can't. I'd be lying through my teeth if I told anybody that I could prove God exists. I can't prove God exists, but he's left more than enough evidence for any thinking person to believe in him. As a human, you are rational, correct? As a human. At times I'm rational, at times I'm highly irrational. But you're supposed to be rational generally. You, you strive for rationality, correct? I was created by God to be rational. Irrational is a destruction of the gift of reason that he gave me. Okay, so yes, good. sir, I try right. to be okay. rational. Cool. So. Um, as a, rational thing, as a rational human, all you can know is what you can measure, correct? All you can know is what you measure. That's what your brain does, right? If it you depends know, how you define measure. Measurement is quite, has, everything has a value. Your eyes see colors because there is a certain value of how long the wavelengths are in the light. You hear certain things and your brain measures the wavelengths of the sound and you hear a sound and you decipher it, right? So all you can know is something that's measurable, right? No. What can you I measure? love this man. Yeah. I cannot measure love. Yes, you can. You can, How do you, you measure can, love? You can, in the lab, recreate the chemicals that are dumped in the brain and create a feeling of love. Okay, fine. I disagree. What? I think that, that love is a free decision. It's not just a chemical reaction. I think there's a soul that goes beyond the chemicals. If love is a free decision, why do people go into abusive relationships where they continually say that they love their person? Would they not be disturbed or insane or have a problem that they can't deal with? No, they're just like you and me. They're sinners. Oh, okay. We all have a problem with evil. Every single one of us. Okay, so you believe that you can know things that are irrational. You can know them. I can distinguish between rational and irrational. Yes, so I can, can distinguish. distinguish. Okay, good. That's good. So you can distinguish between rational and irrational. At right? times, yes. At times. So then you can recognize that God is by definition irrational. No, God's not irrational. But do you say that God is, has infinite wisdom? What do you mean by infinite? We're limitless. No. So God does not have infinite wisdom. So God is not perfect. No, God is not perfect in the sense that he's a perfect computer that spins out perfect computer printouts. God is an all-powerful, good, just being who chose to partially limit his power by creating me with a free Wait, will. No, he's an all-powerful being who limits his power. Correct. That God freely chose to limit his power by giving all of us a free okay, will. So is he currently all-powerful or was he all-powerful? He is an all-powerful being who has chosen to partially limit his power you by cannot, giving me... You cannot be all-powerful. Sir, powerful. we're going to have to... I'm going to have to go to someone else if you keep interrupting me. I okay. listen to you. Please listen to me. Okay. You can talk when I'm done. I'll talk when you're done. Fair enough? Okay. Okay. So the all-powerful God 
chose to partially limit his power by giving us a free will. Slap. God made me do it. False. God didn't make me slap him. I chose to slap him. Pull out my wallet. Give him money. That was not God giving him money. That was me giving him money. God chose to partially limit his power by giving us a free will. The reason I say partial is because there will be a day of judgment when the all-powerful God will judge me for the wrong decisions I've made to abuse him instead of respect him. Okay, so he is all-powerful. Because I, you cannot be all-powerful and not all-powerful at the same time. That's not rational, correct? If you want to say that he can be, then you have to recognize that he is irrational. It is totally possible for an all-powerful God to choose to partially limit his power by giving us free will. That is not irrational. If you don't understand it, how? I'm sorry. How can you give something? That's like saying he's 100% except he takes away 5%. All is all inclusive. You have to have all. That's what See, the word that's all why is. I did not agree with you when you talked about infinite and perfect. Okay. You have to be very, very careful. When we say that God is all powerful, it does not mean that God can make square circles. God cannot do the irrational. He cannot make a square circle. Okay. Well, God cannot make two plus two equal five. God cannot both exist and not exist at the same time in the same way. Doesn't happen. So God, so God can't do things that are impossible, right? Exactly. So, so how did God create anything? If you can't, you can't create or destroy matter. In matter, that's impossible. So, how do you? How yes, do you he can create matter. Yes, he can destroy it. But you just said that he can't do impossible things. No, I and I set those up very carefully for you. I set up mathematics. God does not make two plus two equal five. I set up philosophy and logic. God can both not exist and not exist at the same time in the same way. It can't happen. It's a contradiction. God does not violate the contradictions. So God does not contradict himself, but he's all-powerful and not all-powerful. No, he's, he's all-powerful, but he has freely chosen to limit his power by giving us free will, which so means he does not control what I do to this man. Yeah. I can respect him. Or I can disrespect him. He doesn't make me do either. Okay, let's change the word. Is he omnipotent? Does he know? Sir, everything? if you don't, if you don't move forward quickly, I've got to go to somebody else because you're is beating he, a is dead he, horse. Is he omnipotent? Does he know everything? Obviously, he's all powerful. He's omnipotent. If That's he is what we om, said. if he is omnipotent, that means he knows everything. And no, it doesn't mean he knows everything. That's omniscient. Omniscient means he's all knowing. Is he omniscient? Yes, God is omniscient. Okay, fine. He's omniscient then. So he's omniscient. He knows everything. There's an infinite amount of information. If he has an infinite amount of information, that means there's an infinite amount of things to know about God. That means that you cannot know it conclusively because your brain has a limit on the rationality of things that it can understand. So if by definition you call God infinite, that means that you have to concede that you can never know truly of his state because he is beyond your knowing. Therefore, you cannot prove or even logically believe in him if you use him as that definition. Not only is God beyond my knowing, this man is beyond my knowing. I can't stand here and figure him out. The only way I'm going to have the privilege of knowing this man is if he chooses to open up and reveal to me his name, what he likes and dislikes, his character. The same is true with God. If God doesn't open up and reveal who God is, what God is like, there's no way I'm smart enough to figure out God. But the amazing fact is he can open up and he has opened up to me. So I begin to know him a little bit. If I spent more time with him and we talked more and he revealed more about himself, I would have the privilege of getting to know him better. The same thing is true with God. He's opened up, most clearly by becoming man in Jesus, who spoke human language, lived a human life that you and I can observe. So we can know God by putting our faith in Christ. We can know God in a personal way. It's exciting. You say that you can know as much as you can know him, but you can never truly, truly know another person. You can never know what it's right. like. That's you can right. never know him on a real, emotional, important level. But and he still exists. Yeah, but you can't know him. You can't know it. You can, you can hope he does. See, you all you're doing is, is defining words a certain way. And fine, if you want to define him that way, I can tell you. I won't use him because I don't know him that well. All right, Chandler, could you give me a second? All right, I know her. She's my niece, okay? She pitched here on the softball team at Texas State. I know Chandler. Do I know everything there is to know about Chandler? No. But that doesn't mean that I can't know my niece, okay? 
doesn't mean I can't have a relationship with her. You're absolutely right. Do I know everything there is to know about Chandler? No way, not even close. Similarly, I don't know everything there is to know about God, but he has chosen to reveal part of himself, and that's the part that I get to know. It's that simple. Well, then how come he has not revealed himself to me? I have looked for God often. Oh, of often. course he's revealed himself to you. Well, then why has he not given me the capacity to recognize him? You do have the capacity to recognize him. Really? How come? How because you he gave that? you that capacity. But how do you know that? Because you're a fellow human being. So that's just inherent? Exactly. <laughs> inherent. Study anthropology. Every culture around the world has some form of religion. God has left his imprint on all of us. I don't know if that's true, because if I, if, I, if, I if I am competent in all other aspects of my life, yes. right, and I have, not, I have no, yeah. any more than anyone else, no more faults than anyone else, yeah. you know, okay, and I look for God, and I wish to see him, and he is kind and infinite, and he recognizes that I'm looking for him, why does he not either show himself to me, or allow me, grace me with the capacity to recognize his existence? All right, he has graced you with the capacity to recognize his existence. He has given some evidence to you. But due to his self-restraint, he's not going to force you to believe in him. Due to his self-restraint, but I want to. He is he not going to force, force you. I would feel very comfortable. I would feel way better if I could really believe in God. But I have tried multiple ways, and I can't. I can't do it. But if Why? I want to, why can't you? Because of the logical inconsistencies. <laughs> no, sir. You threw some of those logical inconsistencies at me already. Sir, all of them are games you're playing by misdefining words. You tried the omnipotent one. I'm sorry, sir. You can have an omnipotent God who can choose to freely limit his power by creating us free. That is not a contradiction. But I mean, if you want to make it a contradiction, you can. But it's not a contradiction, sir. As much as you'd like to make it try to be one, it's not. You can say, well, God is all-knowing. He's got an infinite amount of knowledge, so therefore I can't know it. That was a humongous breakdown, sir, in your thinking. God can be all-knowing, can give me a mind, a rational mind, that can know, not the way he knows. My mind is definitely limited to many of your minds, and compared to God's mind, obviously my mind is limited. But that doesn't mean I can't know God. It doesn't mean I can't know him. One of the reasons that I believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead is because his disciples doubted him. His disciples were skeptics. All of his disciples deserted him in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was arrested. His bravest follower, the Apostle Peter, denied knowing him three times. And one of his 12 apostles, Judas Iscariot, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. I appreciate the record in the Gospels of the skepticism, the doubts, the desertion of Christ by his disciples. They were not gullible blind puppies. They were skeptics. But something radically changed them. They claimed it was the resurrection of Christ. They saw Christ risen from the dead. And they went to their martyrdom because they refused to buy into emperor worship. They insisted Jesus is Lord because Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, what does the resurrection mean ultimately for them and for you and for me? What can it mean when we put our faith in Christ? The resurrection of Christ means life has hope and meaning. There is life after death. You have, can have a future that stretches into eternity when you put your faith in Christ. Same for me. If there is no resurrection, there is no hope. For if there is no resurrection, when you die, you rot. When I die, I rot. And if all of us rot when we die, if all of us go to the cosmic fertilizer pit, then it means that ultimately life has no real meaning. Because it doesn't matter what you do. We're all headed for the same destiny. Secondly, the resurrection means that love is stronger than death. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We read in John 3, 16. Love, the love of God, is stronger than death. 
Thirdly, the resurrection means that goodness and power are ultimately allies, not enemies. The resurrection means that the God who is good, the God who is all-powerful, has broken death and offers us the option of eternal life. And goodness and power do not have to be enemies, they can be allies. And in Jesus Christ, in the living God, goodness and power are allies. Too frequently in life, goodness and power are enemies. But in God, in Christ, goodness and power are allies. Fourthly, the resurrection means that life wins in the end. The resurrection of Christ, the promise that he makes to all who put their faith in him, that you will have eternal life, is a clear affirmation of life. It's a clear statement that life wins over death. Fifthly, the resurrection means that good has touched us right here where we are and has defeated our last enemy, death. The good God has defeated our last enemy, death. Goodness will ultimately triumph. Evil will ultimately lose because God is good and God has defeated our last enemy, death. And sixthly, the resurrection means that we are not cosmic orphans. We're human beings who are treasured by Almighty God. We are treasured so much by God that He wants us to spend eternity with Him in heaven. That's what the resurrection means. And that's why I plead with you, read the Gospels, examine the evidence that Jesus really did die on a cross for the purpose of paying the debt of our wrongdoing. And the reason you can trust Him is because three days later He rose from the dead. Life has triumphed over death. Now do you want that life, that eternal life, that Jesus promises to all who trust in Him? I'm sure you do. Because every time you get really sick, you go to the best doctor that money can buy, that you can afford. Why? Because you don't want to die, you want to live. You affirm the value of your life. Jesus Christ's resurrection is a clear statement. God affirms the value of your life. He wants you to spend eternity with Him in heaven. Trust in Christ. Trust in God. Ask Him to forgive you for your wrongdoing. Accept the gift of His grace, His forgiveness. Accept the gift of life eternal that Christ promises to all who trust in Him. I'm one of the pastors of Grace Community Church. We meet at Grace Farms located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'd love to invite you to join us for our 9.30 service and for our short 5 to 5.30 service Sunday afternoon. Thanks for joining us for these few minutes. Have a great day.